Chapter 35, Political Maneuvers, Part 1 Council Chambers, Jedi Temple, Coruscant, Good and Evil No matter what some say, the very concept is subjective. One being's angel could very well be another's devil. It's all about one's morals. A being's individual perception of the outside world, that and the perception of the society in which you live. In a future that won't be, Vader said it best. From his point of view, the Jedi were the evil ones, while Obi-Wan naturally thought otherwise. In essence, that was why we were gathered in the Jedi Council's chambers. The Masters were about to render judgment on one of their own, and on me, though no one was saying aloud that dirty little secret. Finally, it was time for Windu's trial. The most powerful and wise of the Jedi were about to decide whether Mace acted as overzealous fool during the first attack on the temple, one who came very close to treason against the Republic, or if he was right and I am an embodiment of the very evil the Order was formed to vanquish. I looked around, trying to keep a shit-eating grin from appearing on my face. Despite the vocal protests of some Jedi, the trial was going to be public. Even better, it was going to be transmitted live throughout the galaxy. On the downside, besides few floating camera droids and the Jedi Council, only few outsiders were permitted in this hallowed place. The first kind were the representatives of the Senate, which were Senators Padme Amidala and Bail Organa. When I tried to find out how much political capital those two spent to get the positions, I was impressed. Let's just say that it was a considerable amount. But enough about the senators. I was much more interested in the second kind of blokes let in. After all, I was one of them. Needless to say, those were the GAR representatives, made up by Valentra and myself. We had arrived escorted by teams of clones who were pointedly heavily armed and armored. That stunt, which was liable to piss off many Jedi, would have an impact on the public which saw us thanks to the running cameras floating around. They would reach their own conclusions. If someone had failed to figure it out, the trial had many purposes, with Mace's prosecution about the actual laws he might or might not had broken, being rather down the priority list. First, it was a publicity stunt. That was obvious to the most of the civilized galaxy. Second, the Jedi Council had to make a political decision, a monumental one, which one way or another would change the order. Ironically, no matter what they did, this trial could easily lead to fracturing within their ranks that might be impossible to mend, even without Palpy and me acting according to our own agendas. But I digress. I am a Sith, a well-known one, whose, let's say, religion was becoming something of a public secret. At best. At worst, everyone and their third cousin, twice removed, knew it. Even if technically I wasn't from the type of Sith who were outlawed in the legal nightmare that were the Republic's law books. So as far as the Jedi should be concerned, I should be the enemy they had trained to fight for the last thousand years, right? That was the snag. I was also a well-known person who was even rather popular with the Republic citizens. A competent general, a war hero to boot, who was being called the savior of Ryloth lately. One wouldn't be surprised to know that after the last few months of the war, I was better liked and respected than but a handful of Jedi. As important was the fact that a lot of the surviving crop of senators believed that my intervention during the Senate siege was the only reason they were still in one piece. More or less. Then, there was Mace Windu, a great bloke who had managed to piss off the whole gar, a bad thing in the current political climate. During the massive CIS offensive that came perilously close to winning the war for the bastards, everyone important knew that it was only thanks to the tremendous sacrifices of the armed forces, both clones and ordinary people alike, that the line was held and the Republic was still in the game. So right now, the GAR was getting everything we wanted, and then some more. To say that the Jedi Council was under tremendous pressure to just throw Windu under the airbus and wash their hands of him was a hilarious understatement. Amusingly enough, they would have done just that under different circumstances. Nevertheless, there was one snag with that course of action. Doing so would be admitting to themselves that I wasn't the evil Sith TM out to conquer the galaxy, slaughter the Jedi and corrupt everyone in sight, and not necessary in that order which would piss off the conservative fraction of the Order who were supporting Windu while believing that I must be stopped at all cost. 
To make things worse for the Council, that was not an insignificant number of the Jedi at large. The only reason I hadn't had more confrontations like that with Windu was that the Jedi were spread thin across the galaxy. On the other hand, there was an increasing and influential minority of men and women within the Order who were at least neutral towards me, if not downright friendly. Obi-Wan, Shock T, Alea Secura, Plo Koon, just to name a few. Not to mention their own chosen one, to whom I was slowly becoming a mentor. Hus Arke Kufo. The doors of the council chambers slid open again, halting my train of thought. Master Yoda slowly walked in, followed by the towering figure of Ki Adi Mundi. The Grandmaster's cane was clattering ominously on the metal floor in step with his ponderous gait. Once the tiny Jedi Master made his way to his chair, he sat down and looked around. His eyes stopped on Valentra and me for a moment, and he hummed with something that resembled disappointment. He obviously wasn't amused by the stunt we pulled out with our heavy guard detail. Yoda pointedly paid no attention to the cameras floating around like a bunch of overgrown insects and started speaking in a calm, almost bored tone. Gathered today we are, one of our own to judge, he came straight to the point, without wasting any time. Mace Windu, brought in will be, Yoda ordered. Moments later, the doors hissed open again, revealing two faceless masks. They belonged to a pair of temple guardians, escorting the Jedi Master in. Windu strode in, clad in simple brow robes. I would give him that. He had an aura of power around him. To the ordinary spectator, he would appear sure in the outcome of the trial. There was no sign of worry or apprehension in the way he was carrying himself, as if he wasn't the one on trial today. Perhaps it was an act, or he simply believed strongly enough in his cause, knowing deep within his heart that it was a just one, the right one. When Mace was in the center of the chamber, surrounded by a quartet of guards, the show really started. Mace, Windu, you stand accused of grave misconduct. Ki Adi Mundi started speaking, unbecoming of one bearing the rank of Jedi Master. Despite their steel discipline, the clones surrounding Valentra and myself stirred. To the left, my fellow generals scowled. Meanwhile, the Jedi Masters were giving each other cryptic looks and attempted treason. Plo Koon added in a rasping voice. I could sense the surrounding clones calming down, glad that the Jedi, who still were the bulk of their highest-ranking commanding officers, didn't just betray them out of hand by ignoring Windu's near treason. As for myself, I had to suppress a grin. The game was finally afoot. How do you plead? asked Kenobi. Obi-Wan looked calm, almost serene, the epitome of a Jedi Master. However, for someone who actually knew the man, like myself, it was obviously that he was on edge. Kenobi knew better than most what was at stake during this trial. Windu looked each of the Jedi Masters in the eyes for few moments. If doing my duty, protecting the citizens of the Republic and my fellow Jedi from the very threat this order was formed to combat is counted as treason today, then I plead guilty. Mace's voice thundered around the chamber. Suddenly it was quiet, deafeningly so. The force was shifting, jow wildly around us, like a nervous animal. It was biding its time, waiting. It was a whisper, almost beyond one's capacity to hear. It was a promise for boundless possibilities, and it was all centered around Mace Windu. I blinked, my eyes widening in understanding, something mirrored by some Jedi masters. In this force-saturated place, we were able to perceive the edge of an ability one must be born with a gift Mace had. We were sensing the outer edges of a shatter point, one concentrated on the trial we were participating in. Windu could see it, perceive its very nature in a way none of us ever could. He could influence it, and the accused Jedi Master was doing it right now. Tell me, my friends, since when is it a crime to arrest a Sith? Since when is forbidden to do one's best to stop an enemy in our very midst who is subtly gaining more and more power? More than a third of the Jedi Masters were nodding in unison with his words, clearly agreeing. Another group, almost as numerous, were displeased by what he was saying. The two main camps within the Jedi Order were revealed within seconds of the trial's start. It was also clear that the outcome, whatever it was going to be, would be decided by those who were more or less neutral on the issue, just as I knew it would be the case. This enemy you speak of, a human Jedi Master I was unfamiliar with asked. Windu turned his head towards me. I could see a gleam of triumph in his eyes. He 
he pointed an accusing finger at my chest. Darth Delcatar Vale, a dark lord of the Sith, one who had wormed his way into the very heart of the Republic Armed Forces, a position where he could cause untold harm once he shows his true colors for everyone to see. Indeed? I asked, raising an inquisitive eyebrow his way. I was pleased to feel that the clones present in the room bristled at the accusation. I looked the Jedi Master straight in the eyes, and that was a mistake. There was a tremor in the Force. It shook me, nearly throwing me flat on my back. R.K. To be Mace Windu at that moment was akin to being a rock amidst angry white rapids, a redoubt in the center of monstrous storm. The Jedi Master was beginning to comprehend that his attempt to influence the Shatterpoint that was his trial might have been a mistake. Somehow, he was able to perceive glimpses of myriad futures, all passing by like speeding starships, all too fast to properly perceive. Some lighter, yet he sensed that the majority were much darker than the present he existed in. Mace frowned. His ability to interact with Shatterpoints wasn't supposed to work like that, at least in his experience. After all, he wasn't so arrogant as to assume that he knew everything about that skill. Then he felt a presence. An inhuman one, vast and powerful beyond belief. Somehow he had gained its attention. Windu felt amusement, followed by a brief spell of clarity in the jumbled train of visions he was experiencing. He saw a hunched figure, cloaked by heavy black robes, sitting on a throne engulfed by shadows. One that was possibly the most powerful force user he had ever sensed and that one was definitely not an adherent of the light side. Then the image jumped again. Windu was floating within crimson void, thick like a sticky syrup. It took him moments to comprehend that he was within someone's rage-given form and substance. He could barely perceive a monstrous helmet made of black gleaming metal before being engulfed by malevolence, pain, hatred, and regret mixed in a potent and deadly cocktail by someone fallen to the dark side. Yet, there was something familiar in the Force signature associated in that vision. The Jedi Master just knew it was about someone he knew for years or more, however he simply couldn't place a name to his feelings. The Force signature of that person was simply that distorted or cloaked by the entity, allowing him to see a glimpse of a possible future. Another shift. He was floating over the temple's great hall, which was filled with fire, smoke, and the screams of the dying. His fellow Jedi, we, relocked in mortal combat with tidal wave of white armored figures. While the knights and Padawans he could see gave an excellent account of themselves, they were buried under a legion of clones, who had brought enough firepower to overwhelm their adversaries by sheer volume of fire, if nothing else. Then he was amidst a lava-covered wasteland, where Obi-Wan was fighting a shadow-wielding azure lightsaber. A fallen Jedi, or a Sith, Mace didn't know. He blinked and was within the Senate chambers, just in time to see a tired and much older-looking Master Yoda jump away from a senatorial pod hurling his way. The Vapod Master was brought down to his knees by the death screams of thousands of Jedi. He was shocked with emotion, and finally he knew what he was allowed to see. A future. The future that would have been if Vale hadn't existed. The fall of both the Jedi and the Republic. Now what? Mace wondered in his mind. He looked at Vale, who was watching him through narrowed eyes, just like the rest of the Force Adepts in the Council Chambers. Someone was speaking, but Windu didn't hear him, being too deep in his own thoughts. He knew a terrible truth now. Without the changes Vale brought, the Jedi would be all but annihilated in the future, and the clones would pay a part in that. Now there wasn't a clear path to the future. Everything was in flux changing too fast to glimpse anything beyond vague traces of danger. Yet Mace couldn't help but wonder whether the fate Vale had in mind for the Jedi was better or worse than the fall he was just warned about. He stood up and turned towards Yoda. Mace Windu had a decision to make. Cools RK, Part 2. Council Chambers. Jedi Temple Coruscant. I don't really know how I stopped myself from tearing into that criffing prick Windu when it became obvious what the bastard was trying to do. Sheer incredulity was part of it, for sure. It has been ages since I encountered someone who actually could influence Shatterpoints, and I had no bloody idea that Windu was one of those people. Second, the episode was over as fast as it began, obviously in failure. 
we all could feel a wave of backslash passing through the Vapod Master, which served him right. How the damn Jedi thought that he could get away with it if he had actually succeeded is beyond me, not with a lot of the counselors present in the flesh, unless they liked the outcome and decided to cover it up. Needless to say, my opinion of the Jedi, whose only reaction was to give Windu a bunch of disapproving glares, didn't endear them to me. Master Windu, I hissed through clenched teeth. In the future, keep your Force abilities to yourself. Indeed, rumbled Yoda, who narrowed his eyes at the accused. More of that, have we will not, the Grandmaster ordered in a tone of voice I had never heard him use in the movies. Though it wasn't that surprising, given that this was the real thing after all. Around me, both Valentra and the clones stiffened. While they could only guess what had just happened, the very idea that Windu could have used his sorcery on such an occasion was pissing them off. The way my men tightened their grip on their weapons was telling. Windu looked around with a pained expression on his face. The coiled cloud of tension that had descended over the council chambers with his entrance tightened even move as he opened his mouth to speak. To my, and a lot of other people's surprise, Windu proved that he was a Jedi Master and a council member for a reason. My fellow Jedi, it appears that I've lost my way as of late, he spoke in a voice dripping genuine regret, which was actually something I didn't expect from my brief acquaintance with the man. In my perhaps overzealous pursuit to protect all we hold dear, I came close to tearing apart the very Republic we are sworn to protect. That was almost as clear an admission of guilt as one could have expected. The Jedi around us stared at their colleague, wondering where he was going. So did I. While I can't help but wonder what future lies ahead of the Republic with a Sith at, at the helm of its armies, one fact remains unchanged. So far, all of General Vale's actions had been for what he sees as the best of our nation. Oh boy, wasn't this a nice, ambiguous speech? While not said, it was implied that my vision for the Republic's future might not be to the liking of either the Jedi as a whole or the power brokers actually running the whole corrupt mess. He was right about that, but that's another story. At the time, I took what I believed to be the right course of action for us all. That's all I have to say for myself. I leave myself to the fair judgment of this council. Windu finished his short speech with a deep bow in Yoda's direction. All eyes turned towards the Grandmaster. The ball was in his court. Shakti felt like massaging her forehead. The abrupt change of tune that Mace has after toying with his Force-given abilities was going to create more problems than it would solve. But more importantly, unless she was very much mistaken, Windu had glimpsed something during his ill-advised attempt to influence the future in his own favor. While he still implied that Vale was at least a potential danger, a person from whom both the Jedi and the Republic as a whole should be wary of, for at least some, the Jedi Master's words would be viewed like an endorsement for Del Katar. In just few short sentences, Windu had poured fuel on the flames of both Vale's supporters and the hardliners who viewed him as the greatest threat to the future. Though in the end, Shakti knew that unfortunately most beings would hear whatever they wanted to in Mace's words. Tai stole a brief glance Del Katar's way, seeing him scowl at Windu. She felt relieved that Vale didn't attack her fellow Jedi Master when Mace criffed up with his Force abilities. It wasn't like the Sith wasn't provoked, if the way he had reacted was anything to judge by. Such a disaster didn't bear thinking about. Though the usually suppressed part of her that was the evolved Predator couldn't help but wonder who would have won if those two went toe-to-toe -to -toe against each other. At those thoughts, she had to consciously prevent a quiet growl of anticipation from escaping her lips. Master Yoda had a dilemma to solve, all because Mace had decided to act like a blethering imbecile. The ancient Jedi Master was sorely tempted to use his cane on the much taller human's shins, criffing kids these days. He haven't been in such a mess in centuries. Hmm. A quiet rumble escaped Yoda's lungs. Difficult it is. Served faithfully the Republic you have, he used his cane to point at Windu's chest. Many conflicts resolved, you have. Many lives saved, you have. Yoda's ears drooped in a sign of regret, while he wondered why the younglings like Mace just had to act so rash. Yet, the Grandmaster trailed off, 
glancing from Vale to Windu. Yoda was well aware of all facets of this trial, of all the hopes riding on it, all the expectations and the incredible potential for disaster. Worst of all, no matter what one might have expected, his hands were mostly tied. It wasn't right, yet the trial wasn't about justice or guilt, though there was plenty of both to go around. No, it was about both Jedi and Republic politics. There was a schism within his own order, one Yoda didn't see coming when he had decided that Vale wasn't their enemy. And he should have. After all, Yoda had been the one to train the Jedi, the one who shaped the order for more centuries than he wanted to count, only to be blindsided by an impossibility, a Sith that may not be an enemy, a logical impasse which was undermining the foundation of the current Jedi Order. Yoda closed his eyes, opening himself to the Force, searching for guidance. Even if he already knew the path he should take, he needed to buy time and try to heal the rift in his own house. Guilty you are, of arrogance, short-sightedness, your actions befitting a Jedi Master's were not, part of this council no longer you are. Yoda sharply waved a hand when some Jedi Masters whispered furiously at that turn of events. For Yoda wasn't calling a vote. He was commanding, something he usually avoided. Punishment enough this is not. However, in a war we are. Leaving you in prison a waste of your talents would be. Until concluded the Clone Wars are, a common soldier for the Republic you will be. Plo Koon gave a firm nod. So your guilt will be redeemed in service of the Republic. Windu answered with a single nod. This show is over, Kenobi announced after a subtle gesture by Yoda. The Temple Guardians wasted no time in ushering the camera drones out before leaving with Windu. Quarke, I kept quiet until the chamber's doors sealed behind the last of the guards. Then I looked straight at Yoda. You very well know that letting him go with just a slap on the wrist will be unacceptable, I said. Next to me, Valentra glared at the tiny Jedi. We surely could reach some kind of compromise, Padme hurried to intervene. I'm not sure how much she was aware of the intercouncil and Jedi politics in general, though it should be obvious to someone as experienced in the field of politics that this trial had to be resolved. Now, know this, I do, Yoda said, his ears drooping in what I thought was a sign of regret. Get your wish, you will. All Jedi officers screened will be. Lacking the skills for command who are removed from their positions will be. Valentra glanced my way and I gave him a nod. That will be acceptable for the Army and Navy. Won't such an act be very disruptive? Asked Bale. It was a good question. It will. However, in the long term, we well be much better for it. There were many instances so far that Jedi officers of all levels made critical mistakes, both tactical and strategic. That's not something that we could allow continuing. Some Jedi Masters looked like they approved. Others were unreadable. However, the glares sent our way by about a third of the Council was enough to give me a good idea what they thought of our agreement. In the end, they kept their mouths shut, deciding that enough of the Jedi's dirty laundry had been flashed in public for the time being. Though I just knew those folks would be a pain in my ass in due time. Well, now that's settled. You all know what follows. I smirked letting some of my amusement show. After all, the trial's outcome was something I was going to spin my way while giving the Jedi enough rope to hang themselves. A meeting with our friends of the media, Kenobi grunted. Inevitable it is, muttered Yoda, in a tone making it clear to us all that he wasn't looking forward to the meet and greet with the vultures. The two senators in our midst looked at each other, wondering what the problem with meeting the media was. After all, that was something both of them had to do often enough. Equals RK The Great Hall Jedi Temple Coruscant We made our way to the temple's gates, where a small mob of reporters awaited us. That part of the galaxy's scum was kept at bay by a cordon of clone troopers and temple guardians. I didn't need the Force to know that the security force's tempers were already fraying while they were trying to contain the newsies. I put my best fake smile on my face and strode forward. Valentra moved to my right, schooling his face in a mask of calmness. We let the majority of the Jedi Masters in our wake while they were striding slowly forward, refusing to show themselves as anything but dignified. Well except Shakti and Obi-Wan, who hurried ahead of their fellows to join us. To be fair, I wasn't really sure if it was a sign of support 
or if they wanted to be near in order to mitigate any damage the inevitable interviews were about to cause. I nodded at the clone lieutenant commanding the trooper detachment at the gates, and as was prearranged, he ordered his soldiers to make way. It took Kenobi's sharp order and T's glare to have the same effect on the Guardians, something that didn't remain unnoticed. I made my way to the head of the mob and grinned at them. My friends, undoubtedly you have some pointed questions for both ourselves. I tilted my head at my fellow general and the wise Jedi Masters of the Council. Please go ahead. As expected, what followed was a cacophony of shouted questions. I waited for a few moments before raising a hand. It took them some more time, but they quieted, managing to get to a semblance of order before the rest of the Council could join us. Thus, showing better control than I expected from damn reporters. Let's start with you, miss. I pointed at a pleasant-looking human woman who reminded me of that reporter from the third Mass Effect game. Tanny Lorne from Galactic Press, General Vale. Our viewers would like to know the Army's position on the Council's decision. Further, some of them have concerns about a Sith being the nominal head of the Republic's field forces in these dark times. Miss Lorne, first I can assure you that the Sith I associated with all those years ago are nothing like those you are most familiar with. I'm speaking of the same so-called Sith who were outlawed during the Rusin Reformations. The same Sith who are in league with the Confederacy of Independent Systems in their dastardly scheme to plunge the whole galaxy into war. I paused for a moment to let my words sink in and better judge the emotions of the small crowd. There was curiosity, anticipation, a lot of cynicism, as one would expect from reporters, and not a small amount of fear after all that had happened. At least those were the strongest feelings of the gathered beings before me. It was something I could work with. What some of my detractors whisper in the dark is true. I let those words hang in the air. The pause was just enough for Padme and Organa to join us, shortly followed by the rest of the counselors present on Coruscant. During the Great War, I fought for the Empire. In that conflict, I killed both Jedi and Republic soldiers. However, that war has been over for a long time. The very empire I served, the Republic that was its archenemy, and even the Jedi Order have been gone for millennia. The Republic I now serve is the legitimate galactic government. I paused for effect. In all the years I've lived, one thing hasn't changed. I still continue to fight for imposing order and stability onto the galaxy at large, just as the Grand Army and this very Republic does. Even as we speak, both clones and ordinary people alike bleed and die for this same ideal. I waved a hand, encompassing both Valentra and the clones escorting us. We will do our best to ensure that this conflict is fought to its conclusion with the least amount of bloodshed and collateral damage. However, the individuals who lead the other side, those so-called Sith and their allies amongst the Separatist Council, have shown their true colors. That of terrorists, delusional warmongers, Mass murderers who target military and civilian alike. I took a deep breath. We, your proud guardians from all branches of the Republic military forces, will do whatever it takes to stop the chaos and madness unleashed by this so-called confederacy. We will bring the war criminals leading the CIS to justice, stopping their atrocities across the galaxy once and for all, I declared. To my surprise, the small crowd exploded with cheers, taking me aback. I stood there, basking in their raw emotions. It was bloody glorious. Next to me, the Jedi stood rooted in their places, not knowing how to react. Few of them were in such a position before, and the raw feelings of the gathered reporters were rocking their world. I raised a hand again, waiting for the people in front of me to calm down. As for your other question, I looked the young reporter in the eyes, the army agrees that given the circumstances, simply imprisoning the former Jedi Master Windu and throwing the key away would be a waste. No matter his other faults, he is a competent warrior, one who can be put to good use in defending the Republic in her hour of need. Nevertheless, he is not someone who we feel could be trusted. So how to best to utilize his skills will be the topic of some debates. I paused. Thank you for your insightful questions, Miss Lorne. I pointed at a deep blue male twi'lek next. Let's hear your question, sir. Dan Houtenstein, Coruscant News Network. General Vile, 
Despite the successful military operations you led as of late, the Republic as a whole is seen as being on the defensive. What's more concerning, some of our military analysts say that we are at severe strategic disadvantage, something that allowed the attacks on Coruscant to happen in the first place. How would you comment on that? Actually, that is a very good question, Dan, I said in a serious tone. It was time to pour even more fuel on the fire of anti-CIS resentment and fear. I'm about to tell you a secret that few outside the military know. It has been something that has given those of us in the know a lot of sleepless nights. That got everyone's undivided attention. The reporters were looking at me with hunger in their eyes. After all, it wasn't often that an official was about to tell them a deep, dark secret. Officially. In front of the whole galaxy. I found it hard to keep the serious expression on my face. I had them now. Even better, this was one of the things we discussed in the meeting with the intelligence chiefs. It was decided that I would be the one to confirm the bad news to the citizens at large. It is no real secret that when this war started, the Republic as a whole didn't have a real army to speak of. Just some judicial forces, which while good in their role, were law enforcement units. The same could be said for the Jedi as well. They are excellent in their role. That of peacekeepers and fiendishly good investigators. The fact that they are some of the galaxy's premier warriors helps as well. Some Jedi stood a bit straighter at the unexpected praise, while others, the more experienced and cunning of them, or simply paranoid, waited for the other shoe to drop. The newsies, on the other hand, were lapping up my words as if there was no tomorrow. However, both groups had some major disadvantage. The most glaring of all is their startling lack of numbers. No matter how good you are, when the enemy could simply bury you in numbers without even notice, well... I shrugged. I didn't need to extrapolate on that front. Both groups combined didn't have anything approaching the numbers to face an army. Second, which is as important, pertains to a lot of Jedi. Luckily to us all, that was a problem to which we found a solution which will be announced today. The crowd was becoming restless again. As expected, teasing them with juicy information was working. That problem is simple, yet complex. The mentality in which the Jedi are raised and encouraged to have, well, it's contrary to what one needs to be an effective military officer. There aren't many who were able to raise above what they were taught all their lives behind the temple's walls and become the officers that the Republic needs in her hour of need. That's why the Gar High Command and the Jedi Council reached an agreement. The performance of all Jedi already included within the army structure will be reviewed. Those unsuitable for command positions will be replaced with beings who would find no conflict in executing their duty with their religious beliefs and ideals. I gave a respectful bow to the gathered Jedi counselors. Most of them managed to keep their calm facade, though there were a lot who were glaring at me. The fun thing was that everything I said was factually true. Yet, for one who was unfamiliar or had vague knowledge about the Force, well, they would make their own conclusions about the Jedi and the way the war was prosecuted under their command. While there were a lot of questions shouted my way, I wasn't finished. I raised my right hand in a placating gesture, waiting for an opportunity to speak again. When the crowd calmed down a bit at my latest revelation, I was free to continue. Nevertheless, that's not all there is to our current problems. While the Republic is much bigger than what the traitors hold, with much greater potential economics, we do face some significant problems. To put it bluntly, when the war started, they were ready. Their economy was already on war footing, their shipyards and factories engaged producing warships, weapons and hordes of droids, while we were caught with our pants down. I waved a hand in a dismissive gesture. I understand it, really. No one sane wishes a war. Those of us who truly know it are the last ones who would desire it. We have seen the horrors, we carry the scars, and we have lost too much to it to willingly embrace it. Unless that we knew that sometimes the alternative is worse, and or we are Sith, but that's beside the point. So I can't place all, or even most of the blame on those senators who simply wished for peace and opposed the raising of the Grand Army of the Republic. However, now we all find ourselves with a problem. Until the economy can be placed on a war footing, 
we will be at a severe disadvantage against the CIS. The next few months will be precarious, even if the latest enemy offensive has run out of steam. Now it is a race between our boys and girls, fighting across half the galaxy, trying to stem the tide of evil and buy us enough time to place our house in order and start diminishing the separatists' advantage. I looked straight at one of the camera drones floating in front of me. While it is a dauntless task, it is far from an insurmountable one, for we don't stand alone. Many of our friends have come to the Republic's aid in our hour of need. Even now, Corellian ships and crews race to bolster the Navy in a dozen sectors. That is something that we should be grateful for. Instead of choosing the easy way, instead of simply standing aside while the Republic and the whole galaxy is torn apart in war, the Corellians chose to do the right thing, to risk life and limb to oppose the genocidal madness of the CIS, and that my fellow beings is something that should both humble us and make us forever grateful for their example. For RK Corps. That interview was going to have major consequences across the galaxy. For both the beings who were present there in person and the masses who watched it on the holonet. Ki Adi Mundi carefully studied the gathered reporters while the various beings were wildly cheering Vale. He couldn't help but wonder if this was a foreshadowing of things to come. The general was an increasingly popular man, one who was on his way to becoming indispensable for a republic struggling with enemies from both outside and within, and democracy seldom was able to coexist with indispensable beings around. Er. Nearby, Shakti had trouble keeping her head clear. She was starting to understand why all the Sith were building empires in the past. This was a small crowd, yet the effect of those people's emotions were staggering. T wondered how she would feel if faced with tens of thousands, or even more beings, and what a Sith could do with such a crowd. The Togruta knew that she should be, well, scared isn't the right word, concerned about the potential nefarious plots that might lurk within Vale's head. But she couldn't help it. She was both scared and thrilled at the thought of what he could achieve when playing with such a crowd. She shook her head at those un like thoughts. Shakti needed to meditate and clear up her head. The shots across the bow that Vale sent as a warning towards the council were going to give her additional headaches. She just knew it. Kulzar K, Temporarily Chancellor Office Location Classified Coruscant The Republic's Chancellor watched the proceedings with a frown on his face. His estimate of the threat that Vale represented was revisited once again. Upwards. However, that wasn't his priority right now. He had to find a way to keep the bulk of the Jedi on the front lines, because he was sure that after Vale cleaned house, many if not most of those weak fools would be kicked out of their cushy positions of authority which, of course, would create some interesting opportunities for the Dark Lord of the Sith. Even if it meant that executing the original plan when the time came probably wouldn't be as effective as envisioned. No matter. It wasn't like he couldn't change and adapt when the situation called for it. After all, he wasn't a fossilized Jedi. Far K. Far away, the different members of the Confederacy Council winced while watching Vale speak. The politicians amongst them found most disturbing the fact that their newest enemy apparently could easily win the reporters on his side. Those and their networks were the ones shaping the opinions of the whole galaxy. It did not bode well when that infernal Sith could whip up a bunch of reporters into such a frenzy. One had to wonder what he'd do with the ordinary citizens. Something that soon everyone would know, once the news had some time to be absorbed by the Republic's and, to a much lesser extent, the CIS's population. When all things were considered, those beings running the CIS were grateful that they still had a strategic advantage over the Republic. And last, but not the least, the few beings who were the leaders of a rogue organization within both He Republic and the CIS itself were planning how to use the latest upheaval within their adversaries to the best of their advantage. RK Part 3 Senator Amidala's Suite Republica 500 Coruscant. I can honestly say that spending my last evening on Coruscant here before leaving for Corellia wasn't something that I expected, especially being amongst such pleasant company. The place was Padme's relatively small dining room. As for the company, well, there was Anakin as one might expect, and Shakti. 
After the press conference, she had been once again assigned as my shadow. What amongst what I said could have prompted such a reaction among the Jedi, I wonder? I rhetorically asked myself. Shock T, who was sitting across the table from me, snorted. She spoke as if reading my thoughts. You all but called most Jedi incompetent, made many of us look like a bunch of crazy zealots, and insinuated that you would be replacing us with a bunch of bloodthirsty maniacs in charge of the clones. What's there to be nervous about? Obviously, the time for small talk was over. A pity, I was enjoying the story Padme was telling us about Anakin's antics on their flight from Coruscant towards Naboo during the Trade Federation crisis. Her words just highlighted one of the biggest problem I had with the Jedi. From my and most objective people's perspective, what she said was true. The Jedi, at least most of them, were incompetent as far as being military officers goes. As for bloodthirsty replacements, that would be true only from the Jedi's perspective. For them, most effective military commanders would probably be considered a bunch of murderous maniacs. To be fair, Master T, Windu made a great example for most of the points you raised, Anakin snorted. Further, Delcatar is right. Most of us are unfit for being generals, he muttered quietly. It was obvious that Skywalker was remembering his and Obi-Wan's escapades on Ryloth. How so? asked T. You are speaking from experience, she declared after studying him for a few moments. Yeah. What happened? she asked. I want to know that too. Padme added her two cents, sending a pointed look at her husband and then to the living room where I had noticed a couch. And you? She pointed at me with her fork. I can definitely say that the way you got your version of the story out first was very good for a politician. As one of the leaders of the army, you should know better than to play such games. It is the Senate's job to deal with the press and the politics of the situation. There isn't much of the Senate left, Padme. Besides, if I'm to be honest, I wouldn't trust most of your colleagues with anything of importance. I turned my head towards Anakin. While she had grown up a lot in the short time I knew her, she could still be naive sometimes. You know, Dooku was right when he spoke with Kenobi on Geonosis. Skywalker gave me an empty look. I have no idea what you are talking about. Ah, perhaps you know what I imply? I turned my attention towards Shakti, who shook her head in D. Enial. Her hypnotizing eyes were looking at me with interest. He told Obi-Wan that the Senate and the Republic as a whole were under the influence of a Sith Lord, and he didn't mean me. So Dooku tried to gain Kenobi as an asset at a CIS by lying to him. It obviously failed. Obviously. However, you are mistaken about one point. Dooku told the truth, I declared, and watched with amusement the effects of the bomb I just dropped in their collective laps. It wouldn't be the last for the night either. Even if you are correct, I just can't take your word for that. Not without evidence, declared Padme. To my pleasant surprise, the one who asked the most important question was none other than Shakti. It is a grave accusation, one I can't dismiss out of hand considering how the Senate has been behaving. Though most of those suspicious instances could be written off as simple greed and corruption. She fixed me with a stare. Why are you telling this to the three of us? Such suspicions would be better served if brought to either the Jedi Council or your friend Valentra. Hey, I am a senator. This is need-to-know information for me too, Padme exclaimed. Yet Master T raises a good point. Care to enlighten us? Three pair of eyes converged on me. I leaned back into my chair. It was time to start laying the foundation of the future. You need allies. Shock T trailed off. I have my reasons to want you all on my side. I looked at Padme. You are one of the youngest, yet most influential senators in the Republic. A woman of integrity who stands by her ideals when the going gets tough. Which is something to admire, though sometimes the consequences of your stubbornness could be to the detriment of us all. You and Anakin are never going to let my stand against the Republic Army Bill go, will you? Padme grumbled. Not any time soon, I muttered. To his credit, Anakin remained silent. The young man obviously didn't want to sleep on the couch. Again, Padme, you are a staunch advocate of democracy and freedom of choice, something that will be missing from this galaxy if the CIS or my hypothetical Sith backing them win. Fair enough, she said. It was no secret that there was a conspicuous lack of democracy after the Separatists seized a world. 
or within their own camp if the rumors we got from intelligence had any merit to them. You, my young friend, I pointed at Anakin, will do anything to protect those precious to you, something that the Jedi did little to help you with in the past. Besides to those that still believe in such nonsense as prophecies, you are the chosen one in addition to being a powerful force adept and a talented amateur as far as commanding troops goes. He gave me a stubborn look, but then shook his head. The reminder of what happened with his mother not too long ago was still painful. I could clearly sense his anguish at the reminder. So could Shakti, but she chose to remain silent until she knew more about the situation she suddenly found herself in. And what about me, O oh wise one? Shakti asked. You are one of the best that the Jedi have. An experienced leader, a virtuoso with a lightsaber, and most importantly, someone who no longer takes the Council's propaganda for holy scripture that must be followed at all costs. That she was quite pleasant to the eyes was something I didn't add aloud. It wasn't something she would appreciate right now. Though that thought made a concern resurface in my mind. Was I thinking with my dick as far as Ty was concerned? Well, no matter. Right now was too late for second thoughts. I had made up my mind, and it was high time to start recruiting some high-profile people to my side, or shoot myself in the foot if I had misjudged those three. I have a vision for the future that I want to accomplish. Imagine a galaxy that is stable, a beacon of law and order, a place that no longer strains under the wasteful chaos of this war. I want a peaceful galaxy, one where you won't have to fear the ambitions of petty warlords, a place without rampant crime, a G, alaxi free of slavery, no matter if you are fortunate to live within the heart of the Republic or you are from a force-forsaken world in the Outer Rim. I took a deep breath. That is my dream, and with your help, I might be able to pull it off. My little speech got Anakin's attention at least. It was enough to mention that I wanted to get rid of slavery for good, and he was almost guaranteed to have my back. Besides, straightening up the galaxy was something that he would agree with. Oh my, that's a lot to take in. You sure are ambitious, Delcatar. I can't help but wonder, while those are pretty words you say, do you really mean them? Asked Shakti. Words are cheap. I would like you all to judge me by my actions. Yet, your path is one of carnage, supplied Padme. You can't change the galaxy with only your ideals. More often than not, it takes someone willing to dirty their hands. Do you think that the Huts will stop their criminal enterprises or rein in their slavers if you ask nicely or force some kind of economic sanctions upon them? No, Anakin growled. I know those. Beings, he hissed, remembering his life as a slave. There is only one language they understand. Unless you are willing and able to enforce your terms, nothing will change. For the longest time a big part of the Outer Rim has been a hellhole, and yet neither the Republic nor the Jedi have done a thing to clean up that mess. It is something that should have been dealt with centuries ago. Shakti shook her head in resignation. Anakin, you know that isn't the Jedi way. We are diplomats and peacekeepers. For all the good it did, he muttered. Oh, Ani, Padme whispered, in a way one wouldn't speak to just a friend. Anakin looked at his wife, his funk forgotten something that didn't remain unnoticed by Shakti. She was glancing from Anakin to Padme. I gave the three of them a wan smile. It was time to drop the hammer. Anakin, I believe that you, as well as many of the other Jedi, are aware that I consider you a friend, right? I asked lightly. Skywalker tore his eyes from the stunning image that was his wife. It's truly amazing what some makeup could accomplish, and glanced at me. The change of topic had surprised him. By the way, he shifted his posture. I could gather that he had considerably calmed himself. I think it's safe to say you are correct in that assessment. You aren't one to ask questions you know the answer to. Unless you want to make a point, Senator Amidala stated, while her husband was still regaining his cool. I think Padme got it, I said. The senator had paled a bit. She had a grim expression on her face. Padme, what is it? Skywalker asked. His tone was full with concern. I should have thought of that after today's interviews, even earlier, though today would make it certain. She gave me a cross look. You said it plainly for everyone in the galaxy to hear that you are a Sith. So? Anakin shrugged. It was a public secret anyway. Besides, it's far from being the most memorable thing he said anyway. 
That's my point. Combined with the contents of your speech, that will bring even more scrutiny upon you. And upon your friends, she glared at me. Shakti glanced between the secretly married couple. She had been wondering why Anakin had been invited to this dinner in the first place, and I'm sure that she was disturbed by the way those two interacted, even if they tried to keep things professional. Especially if one of them is the chosen one of the Jedi Order, the Togruta said with a thoughtful frown on her face. An expression which made her look very cute. I simply beamed at her. Say what you will about Skywalker, but he could be fast on the uptake when he wanted. He deflated and looked dejectedly at his half-eaten food. It won't be long now, even without practically announcing it to a Jedi Master. He pointed an accusing finger at my chest. Guilty as charged, Anakin. However, there is a method to my madness. I leaned towards him and Mock whispered, just loud enough for the women to hear. It's a test! The, O's two, are in a relationship. Shakti grumbled. She glared at each one of us in turn, before taking a deep pull from the cup of Nabu wine in front of her. In hindsight, it should have been obvious. How long? A few weeks? Longer? The husband and wife looked at each other, conversing with but a glance. We finally admitted our feelings on Geonosis, Anakin said, and we married soon afterwards, when Ani escorted me back to Naboo after the battle was resolved. Married? Shakti spluttered. Ki Adi Mundi, I interjected, earning myself a withering glare. Don't give me that, Delkatar. You know very well that he is a special case. His species is close to extinction. So, do you really believe that there are no feelings involved between him, his wives, and kids? I asked. He is a Jedi Master. He can control his... Heart? I interrupted her. Trust me about this, Master T. It doesn't work like that, I know. She was about to argue further, but then abruptly clamped her mouth shut. She gave me a pained look and lowered her head. What you showed me, your wife, she fell for and married a Sith during the war, yet she remained a Jedi up until the bitter end. Yes, she never fell to the dark side, despite reveling in her feelings. Ashara let her emotions run free and she was stronger for it, I spoke wistfully, remembering times long past. You were married? Skywalker asked. What happened to her? Padme was fast to add her own question. I gave them an empty stare. She was murdered by the Jedi of my own era. Two simultaneous gasps echoed in the suddenly cold dining room. Shakti winced when I reminded her of my past again. She was looking at her lap, refusing to meet anyone's eyes. Kusar K, Part 4, Padme's Apartment, 500 Republica Coruscant. Delcatar's latest revelation stopped the conversation cold. While both Anakin and Senator Amidala were struggling with the implications of Vale's past, Shakti was trying to figure out what he was aiming for. Unless she was very much mistaken, there was far more to his goals than what he had revealed, which was a given. After all, Vale hadn't told them anything besides a very general outline for the future he wanted. Then it clicked. The Jedi Order. What was its place, the Jedi's place in the galaxy, Delcatar wanted to shape? Then again, if Delcatar wanted them discredited, or even worse, Windu had given him the perfect opportunity during the first attack on the temple. She looked up, unspoken questions shining in her eyes. Her gaze was met by the Sith's amused expression. What about the Jedi? What about them? He repeated her question. The Jedi will make their own choices and reap the consequences, whatever they may be. All I've done is try to steer your counsel away from the path that your kind took in my past. R.K. Meanwhile, Anakin was staring at his wife while his heart was gripped by fear's cold embrace. It wasn't that long ago that he lost his mother. Shmi died of her wounds in his arms. Because he had been too late. Because the Jedi were unsympathetic to his plight. And finally, because despite all that power at his fingertips, he had been powerless to save his mother. He'd been unable to heal her, which was another failing of the Jedi. The only thing available to learn had been the healing trance, something that worked only on oneself. In contrast, he was sitting next to living proof that even a Criffing Sith could heal better than what was officially available to the Order. What was sealed within the temple's archive out of fear, the knowledge that could have saved his mother, probably gathered dust somewhere in the temple, all but forgotten. That angered Anakin, yet it was far from all that burdened him. Part of him feared the Order's reaction once his marriage became public knowledge. Would they expel him? 
demand that he dissolve his marriage? At any rate, it would be a scandal, and a public one at that. While he didn't really care what the effect would be on him, he was exposed to enough politicking to know that Padme's enemies would try to use their seeker at marriage against her. All those thoughts ran through Skywalker's head while he struggled with the bomb that Vale dropped in their laps. Part of him wanted to deny it, to believe that the Jedi, no matter from which era, would do such a thing. Yet, the darker part of his personality, which was born from his childhood in slavery, knew better. He hadn't been innocent for as long as he could remember, knowing very well the evil men did. That cynical part of Anakin Skywalker could very well see it. A raid to either capture Vale's wife to rescue her from the corrupting influence of the Sith, an attack meant to get Vale himself, which found his wife instead, an attempt to kidnap her in order to blackmail an enemy leader. It could have been any one of these scenarios gone wrong, even before Delcatar told them exactly what had happened. About Ashara possessing the fabled battle meditation, so Anakin could almost understand why the Jedi of that time had gone after Ashara. Though in the end, it didn't really matter. Anakin knew that if the roles were reversed, if the CIS somehow managed to get Padme, which the criffing bastards seemed keen on doing, he would go to the end of the galaxy and beyond to make them pay. And if he somehow traveled to a far future in which the CIS or a successor organization still existed, they would be his enemies too. He would have thought that would be even truer for a Sith. Yet, instead of a vengeance-driven monster, he was dining with a reasonable man who not only wanted to finally bring order to a galaxy gone mad, but to crush criffing slavery once and for all. So he was torn and confused. What Vale apparently wanted was the same thing Skywalker's heart desired, beyond seeing his angels safe and happy. Yet he couldn't help but wonder what the catch was. Pad Padme, while married to a Jedi and friends with a few others, didn't really grasp the nuances of the Force, especially the differences between the light and dark sides, beyond one being the evil one. That was through no failing of her own, considering the narrow views and understanding possessed by the Jedi of the era. So while she considered the death of Vale's wife a tragedy, she missed most of the implications. Both about Delcatar and the Jedi who ordered and took part in the raid. Nevertheless, by extrapolating what she knew of the order of her time, she could see that act as being out of character, or one born out of desperation. Just as she viewed Windu's actions. That's how Padme Amidala started wondering how far some Jedi would go while Delcatar's star continued to rise and he accumulated more and more power. A most disturbing thought as far as all its implications went, both about the Jedi's possible excesses and about what Vale would one day decide to do with his power. After all, she was opposed to even Palpatine, an old and dear friend gaining as much power as he already had, and Vale would come to match him if nothing drastically changed in the near future. While what Delcatar said he wanted sounded great for the galaxy as a whole, Padme simply couldn't trust him. Not with this. Not with that much power. If she had to be honest with herself, she probably wouldn't, couldn't condone anyone gaining so much power. Yet, opposing his agenda, while she wasn't really sure what it truly was, wouldn't be the prudent thing to do. She sighed. The Republic was in shambles and barring a miracle, the situation would grow a lot worse before it started improving. The last thing the Republic needed was further internal divisions in the face of the CIS. Besides, Padme didn't have a leg to stand on against Vale. Not when what he said he wanted would be embraced by most, if not all, Republic citizens. She had few appealing choices. In the end, Padme decided to follow what she knew Anakin would go for. She would stand with Vale for now, to see what his vision for the future really was, and to be ready if he was indeed the power-hungry tyrant his detractors tried to portray him as. At least that way she might be able to keep Ani on the a straight and narrow path. So it comes to this, Shock T thought. Suddenly she was in position to fulfill her mission from the Council. She could easily become part of Delcatar's inner circle and learn his plans, so the Jedi could be ready if he was anything but what he posed as. After all, their official position as far as this Sith was concerned was trust but verify. From multiple credible sources, it was a simple thing really. An agreement, 
one that was non-binding or anything at least for now. Yet, the Togruta couldn't help but feel trapped. Somehow T found herself in a position where no matter what she would chose, she would betray someone's trust. That very thought caught her off guard. Since when did Vale's trust mean anything at all to her? I would like to see this future of yours unfold, Padme broke the silence to everyone's surprise. She smiled frosty. As long as securing this galaxy from the insanity of this war is your goal. That much I can guarantee. I don't want this galaxy torn asunder by conflict or to crown myself emperor or other such nonsense. Shakti was stunned. As he spoke, Delkatar dropped his shields for an instant. For a moment, she could clearly feel veil through the force. He was telling the truth. Not even a hint of deception. Then the barriers slammed back in place, and Delkatar was once again a whirlpool of light and dark energies. Shakti briefly considered the possibility that he was trying to manipulate them, but she discarded it. The Force didn't lie. Vale was serious about bringing order and stability to the galaxy without, unlike any Sith she had heard before him, wanting to be the one in charge of everything. Delkatar looked her in the eyes and smiled. I know that despite everything that happened in the short time I've been here, I've yet to earn your trust. So I won't ask you to choose between following my path or the Council. I'm aware that they want you to report on my actions, and that's fine with me. I hope that by telling them the truth, you would help convince the more traditional-minded Jedi that I'm not a monster fit to be tied. I see. Shakti trailed off. That was certainly not what she had expected. Which she was glad that her loyalties wouldn't be tested any further that day. Well, we'll see how your actions speak for themselves. Besides, you'll need someone to keep you out of too much trouble, she smirked at Vale and gave him a toothy grin. When she turned her head towards Skywalker, the young Jedi shrugged. What? he exclaimed, noticing that everyone was looking at him. You know my opinion on slavery. Neither the Republic nor the Jedi did a criffing thing to clean up the Outer Rim. If Delkatar wants to make a difference, I'm behind him 100%. As for the catch, we'll wait and see, Skywalker thought. RK. Well, that's a much better reception than I feared. I gave them a genuine smile. Oh, I was well aware that I had only their tentative support for now, and at least Padme was likely to go along only to see if in the long run, I was either an asset or threat to her precious republic. Needless to say, I was all right with it. Those were just the first steps to binding them to my side. After all, if I wanted them as reliable long-term allies, it would take some time and a lot of effort to convince them that my plans were not only necessary, but something that they should support of their free will. What's your plan? Because what you stated were the end goals? Padme asked. Why? It is simple and obvious. We reform the Republic, I declared. That's certainly a bold statement. Padme gave me a wary look. Oh, I'm aware of that. It will be painful and rocky process, but stunts like the invasion of Naboo and nothing being done about it, such things can't be allowed to happen ever again. That's a low blow, Vile. Padme glared at me. That makes it no less true. We need to eradicate the corruption crippling the Senate, and that's something in which you would be invaluable. I flattered her. He's kind of correct, Padme. If the is war is to end, we need to solve the problems that caused the creation of the Separatists. A lot of their grievances were genuine, Shakti said. It was pleasant to see that she had her head out of the sand and knew that the Republic as it was, was one monumental train wreck in progress. Or at least, she was starting to suspect it. So, how would we theoretically go about fighting the corruption on the higher levels of the Republic's government? I asked the senator. Padme frowned for a time, then she started speaking. Cools R.K. Later that night, Primary Republic R&D Complex Coruscant. A few hours after the dinner was concluded, successfully at least in my opinion, I went to check up on a pair of projects, which would be combat tested during the coming assault on Geonosis. It took me a lot of time to pass through all the now mandatory security checks in order to enter the complex, but I finally reached one of the dark rooms from where I could access the data. Login, Vale, Delkatar, codename Rogue Knight. Password, Day's codeword, Purple Midnight Scanning, Voice Print Confirmed, Retinal Scan Confirmed, 
Biometric scan confirmed. DNA scan confirmed. Deep scan concluded. No foreign objects detected. Access granted. General voice command input active. Display status of Project Helldiver. I ordered. Accessing databanks. Searching. Data found. Warning. All files pertaining Project Helldiver are classified under codeword Crimson Sonata. Ident Bloody Harvest. Codeword accepted. Displaying files. Project Helldiver status Phase 1 ready for combat trials. Phase 2 on standby pending high command approval and combat data from Phase 1. How many units will be ready for Geonosis? Phase 1 prototypes approved for limited production run. 1000 plus. 5% completed units expected in allotted time period. Splendid. Approval for preliminary funding of Phase 2 is granted. Log off Project Helldiver. Access Project's Ascension and Rebirth. Accessing data. Warning Project Ascension is protected under codeword Black Dawn. Warning Project Rebirth is protected under codeword Black Sunrise. Ident Shadow Contingency. Ident Last Resort. Codewords accepted. Displaying files. Project Ascension. Status. Phase 2 complete. Phase 3 is ready for implementation. Selecting volunteers is currently in progress. Estimated time to completion, 2 galactic weeks. Project Rebirth. Phase 1 is in progress. Analysis of gene sequences 30% complete. Research of genetic modification procedures in progress. Estimated time to completion, Nene. Raise priority on Project Ascension. I want the procedures to begin within the week. Log off Project's Ascension and Rebirth. Access Project Dragon. Accessing data. Warning Project Dragon is protected under codeword Crimson Tide. Ident Whirlwind. Codeword accepted. Accessing data. Project Dragon. Status. Phase 1. Preliminary design complete. Phase 2. On standby. Pending completion of projects Phalanx and Hermes. Good enough. Log off Project Dragon. It's time to catch some shut-eye. Logging you off. Query unclear. Please repeat request.